Hi everyone, I have the first agenda item, so I can go ahead and share my screen. So a bit of background here, I've been working on promoting the telemetry API to beta for the past couple of months. And we have the scope for that defined, but now um, we aren't sure what is the best mechanism for doing so. Because as I investigated how we currently um, manage Istio API versions, um, I saw a couple of red flags and I thought this can be a really good opportunity to propose a new way of doing this. Um, I'll get into the motivation later on, but um, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the Gateway API um, release channel model, but this proposal sort of emulates that. And as of now, it looks like what Gateway API is doing is becoming sort of a de facto standard around like managing CRD and APR versions. Um, there are other SIG Kubernetes cloud native projects that are adopting it as well. And I would love for us to um, come to some form of consensus around if we also want to make this transition to ease some of the frictions we are facing currently, um, as well as keep in mind that this is still a work in progress where Istio's specific requirements around adopting this hasn't fully been fleshed out yet, as I want to ensure that we are all interested in making this change first. So with that said, this proposal is proposing a transition to a new unified release model that allows flexibility of experimenting with new features in our Istio APIs while still delivering a stable API to our end users. Um, as of now, right now we can see that the features within an Istio API has varying levels of stability. So um, regardless of the API version, they are like experimental to like stable fields slash features in that API version. And we need something that enable like an independent feature life cycle distinct to that of the API version. Also, um, right now, our SEO APIs are based on Kubernetes CRDs, which encounter a known challenge around converting between API versions that have different schemas. So in Istio, we have decided that or we are enforcing like identical schemas across all versions of the same CRD. But that led to a new problem where um, even if you're using a stable API version, you have deprecated and fields present in that CRD version without any um, proper feature gating to ensure that the end user is actually using their expected stable API version. Another issue that I saw is around um, the fact that we have four different feature phases, experimental to stable, and that has required a lot of operational oversight to manage the progression of the API versions across those phases, as well as um, right now we are managing four different graduation classes, different API versions that stick around, and um, all of this is to supposedly inform the user that this API is stable versus unstable, but there isn't a lot of like incentive that sort of incentivize developers to accelerate their graduation across the phases, especially when you get to between beta and stable, we are sort of being stuck in this beta phase without any um, solid way to, I guess, push the API version to stable as well as um, there's there isn't a lot of like valid reason for maintaining this based on the overhead that we have. So based on these motivations, I'm proposing um, adopting the release channels, which is what Gateway API does. And with having two release channels, one focus on experimental features and the other focus on standard, um, we are now able to allow um, new experimental fields and resources to be added to our Istio APIs without having, while still being able to provide a stable API. So um, what does that look like? In the experimental channel, we have, um, the, there will be like API versions across experimental to the GA um, feature phases. 
And then the fields that are allowed in the CRDs in this channel will be experimental and standard. You can view this channel as a superset of the standard channel, which will now only have GA stable API versions, as well as um, standard API fields. So there's no experimental fields that are part of the CRDs in the standard channel. So this goes more into depth in terms of like what the CRDs actually look like. For instance, in the standard eight, the standard channels, they will be V one time. Give me one second. Sorry, my dog keeps barking at everyone that's passing. <laughs> um, so in the standard API channel, there will be V1 kinds. And like I said, all features will be stable and only compatible changes will be allowed. Um, if there are new fields to be added, that will go into the experimental channel and that will go into a new um, experimental kind where we will be incrementing um, the that V1 experimental V1 alpha um, kind by one. When objects graduate from experimental, they will go directly into the V1 kind in the standard channel. So there isn't going to be like a V1 beta 1 or V1 beta 2 or so on. It will just be that V1 kind that will be the go to um, stable version of the CRD. So um, these are some diagrams that help show like what the actual life cycle looks like for the field. Like um, as we know, it will start as an experimental field and then it will go through several iterations where we test if it's widely used and working well. Um, if it's not widely used and working well, we will evaluate if these changes, there will, if there are any changes that can help. If yes, a new kind will be a new experimental um, API object will be created with that new experimental field, and that will go through that cycle again. If no, it will be removed from um, the API. And uh, if yes, if this has been done several times and there is no additional changes needed, it can now be determined that it's stable and it will be graduated to the standard channel. Same with like the resource lifecycle, we will first start with an experimental API version and um, based on whether it's widely used and working well, and um, if there's no additional changes needed, then it will be graduated to um, the standard V1 um, API version. Cool. So this involves, yes, Justin? I, maybe you'll be getting into it. I was just curious. So. Does that mean that we just, um, like that there's no criteria for graduation, like it just sort of automatically happens so that we don't end up in this situation like we currently have where things say perpetually in alpha or beta? Yes, um, so this proposal involves improving the graduation criteria to ensure that it is specific and there is clear um, understanding of what is required for promotion to like standard. Um, Right now, this is done based on the understanding of um, we want to ensure that whatever features has been in experimental has done the cycle several times where changes have been done, testing has been um, created, and without a doubt, we know that it is stable. So then it can go into the stable channel because once it's promoted, it will not be necessarily removed easily. Okay, but so the graduation happens automatically. I'm not sure. I haven't looked through the document very carefully, but um, what do you mean by it happening automatically? Well, currently we just we ended up in the situation where we have uh, various APIs that had to go through a certain level of approval in order to move up, and then people just didn't bother to do the work that would require required to move it up to the next level. So, are we going to? push some of that stuff earlier and then just make it automatic like that if there are um, if it seems like everything is working working okay then it automatically gets graduated after a certain number of releases 
Um, I'm not sure if we can truly make it automatic as yet, but based on like the enhancement subgroup as well as like the different folks who will be involved in overseeing these APIs, for instance, like release managers, we can work with them to figure out how we can include this in their regular processes. But the plan is that we want to ensure that it is moving up and it does not get stuck again. And I think with having a refined criteria, um, a refined criteria that clearly has specific um, expectations, because will help that, will help us evaluate if it's ready for graduation or not. And then will we then have a method for removing it if it isn't seeming like it's moving in that direction? Yes, we plan to, yep. Okay. We want to keep right. move. We want to keep moving features up and out. That will hopefully be the general way of operation in Istio. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll follow up with questions in the doc. Thanks, Justin. I think the idea is that we have to get up working before we can start talking about out. Oops. Right. I just want to make sure that there is a. Yeah, we'll need a uh, a stick along with a carrot though to. Yeah. And, and define that totally criteria. Agree. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Um, so that's the different resource life cycles. Um, some still need to be fleshed out is the tooling and like the upgrade process based on how Istio D currently manages things. As of now, Istio D reads the oldest version of the API. Um, and uh, we have to figure out how that will change with this new channeling model. And for the most part, the roadmap that I'm proposing is once we know that we want to move in this direction, um, implement the adoption of the release channels as well as like updates in the feature phases, graduation criteria, hopefully drop in beta because we see that beta creates more overhead than benefits. And then of course, even rolling that out to the rest of Istio, which this proposal isn't um wouldn't be blocked by that, but that is, I guess, the general intention of like updating these graduation criteria. And then um, I hope to use the telemetry API feature as the first feature that we um, graduate using this mechanism. And any future features will have to conform to the graduation criteria that is set before being able to be graduated. And that's it in a nutshell. I have different references. Um, based on Kubernetes, um, gateway API discussions, and um, graduation criteria that we are proposing that should um, make the graduation process much more seamless. I see some hands up. I'm not sure who raised their hand first. I think what? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't think I was the first. There's a phone room. Let me speak first. I'm guessing uh, Costin, but I'm not positive. No, that's me. Um, oh, John. hey, John. Um, yeah, I guess I'm a bit concerned about how we go from where we are today to to this model. I get in Kubernetes, they largely started with the model. I mean, they kind of adopted it, but it was very early in their project life cycle. Like, if we go and say all the things that are v1 are stable and everything else is experimental 100 uh, percent of people using Istio today will probably use experimental or they'll need to to maintain the current feature set and now we're saying that the stability of experimental is actually worse than it is today it's both experimental and we're going to go make breaking changes that actually have major impact to you not just it's experimental and therefore we might accidentally break you because you know the code is not stable um, so I'm a bit worried about that specifically, but more in general, like how we actually get from here to there. Um, I do agree with the long-term strategy of less API versions, um, but it's a bit tricky to get there. I agree with those concerns. Um, top of mind, I think we will probably be stuck in a world of using the current versions as is, as well as slowly um, taking, tackling one API at a time to really bring it over into the new channeling model. And the goal is to make the APIs stable as quickly as possible. So any existing API um, 
if it has a part rate to stability, let's get it stable before bringing it across to the channel approach. And if there isn't a part rate to stability, that's a great opportunity for us to really um, highlight any concerns and figure out what we really want to do that if we are really trying to maintain a up and out momentum in STO. I want to echo some of uh, John's comments, but in a slightly different way. Um, first of all, I'm a big fan of this proposal. I think it's a great proposal. I also love the gateway equivalent. Um, I really want to see us going there, but as John, I don't think East your classic East your with site as a current API that everyone is using is the right place to do this. For the same reason that John mentioned, plus other similar reason. I think Ambient is a perfect candidate for this. And uh, for the APIs that are shared between Ambient and Istio Classic, that's a perfect candidate to put in, in the stable version because again, we are at the cusp of, of having you know Ambient move to beta. A lot of people have interest in Ambient and there is a huge difference in APIs between, between, um, between the two. So going to say that the current API in Istio with Sidecar are stable knowing full well that most of them will change dramatically. Um, well, subtly, I mean, again, we, we have parent ref versus workload selector. I mean, yes, it has the same name, but it's fundamentally very different in, uh, you know, how you use workload selector versus how you use a parent ref is not a tiny thing. It's, it's, it's probably the most important thing. There is this, you know, um, and also a lot of things work differently as behavior. So, so uh, let's try it on ambient. Let's have ambient with a stable channel and experimental uh, when it launches to beta. So, so basically it's easier to, uh, you know, Verify how the very is a concept, get users used to the idea, start them on the right path when they adopt ambient. And gradually, this API that will be in ambient and implemented commonly. I mean, whatever is common between the two, two versions will be the, the, the stable release. Um, and that way everyone wins because users will have, you know, an API, they know they can use both of them and, and they know that the, you know what, what is stable is is is, is the API, not a particular implementation and variant. Uh, at the same time, telemetry has put in in, 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 a, in a comment, we could move it to V1 or whatever we want independent of this. We don't have to couple this huge improvement, but you know, for the entire ecosystem to telemetry, which is kind of a tiny API that really is not that that, that critical. The challenge with telemetry API, and I, I guess across the board, all other APIs, is that in graduation, we're only graduating a subset of those fields to um, stable, but we don't have an actual tag that we can like sort of denote um, the stability in the current API version. So we only have like the deprecated flag available and we don't wanna, I guess, label the fees that we didn't promote to deprecate it because that doesn't seem right. So that's why I thought that let's get it right with telemetry API. Yeah. yeah, but, but that, that's kind of a syntactical, you know, internal detail how we mark. We just put documentation. This field is not stable. Or we, we have ways. We can create a new proto with telemetry. I mean, there, there are plenty of technical ways to express that some fields are stable and some fields are not. Even in the V1 APIs, we keep adding some fields, which by definition are experimental. Uh, yes, we don't have a tag, but we can have documentations. We can explain which fields are promoted and supported. It's not necessarily a black and white uh, completely, you know, uh, we need a new process, a new thing, just because we cannot indicate to the yeah. users that the field is not stable. I think this proposal is really asking the question, if we are okay with just semantic labeling then versus like actual enforcing a certain like functionality slash safe mode <laughs> in Istio. Um, so I think if everyone is okay with the semantic, then telemetry API isn't really blocked with this. Um, but in general, I think we should really, I guess, care about if we're going beyond the semantic. Yeah. I want to jump in here just because I, I think Kostin brings up an interesting point about how gateway doesn't make certain fields as standard versus experimental. That's it's to this proposal. So by separating the, the, the channels, you can have one resource that belongs in both channels, but it's subtly different, right? You can have 
uh, not even subtly, but it's, but it's different, right? The standard version has a subset of fields that the experimental version does, and those subset of fields in the experimental version um, can, or can be, you know, can have breaking changes. And to, to answer John's question about how do we get from where we are today in the future, what, what I love about this proposal um, and, and the model in general, I agree, we don't have to do it, it's not for telemetry only, but I think telemetry API is a good, is a good thing to start with because we, there's already been work there. But what I think is great about this proposal and this, and this model is that the way we get from where we are today to the future is I think we, we, we start looking and bifurcating existing APIs. We look at the APIs that we have, telemetry, virtual service, et cetera, and we look at what is exper like what is truly experimental, what meets the bar, and what doesn't. And then, you know, yeah, I think there are there are my mig potential migration challenges. Um, but what creating a standard channel does is it allows users to to look at their installation and say, you know, I'm I only I only am really using standard in, uh, functionality of SEO. I can use the standard channel. And then if you need experimental uh, things, say something like, I don't know, outlier detection, it's probably more stable than I think it is, but just to take a well-known thing, if you need outlier detection in virtual service, you need the experimental channel. And not only does that send a signal to users that what they're using is experimental, not only is that better representing, better as an improvement on today, a representing of how experimental a thing actually is within a beta service, it's also showing them places where we where they can be uh, have impact uh, in the projects if they, there's work where there's work that needs to be done. It's it's a better demonstration. And so Gateway API does this. I think there are some probably some technical concerns there, but I think I, I I'll read Kwat's message in the chat when I when I finish. But I even though field might not get as a hundred percent of the way, um, I think that it is a as a Strict improvement, I think, in my opinion, I could be wrong, but from what I understand, I think that that being able to to do that and have the same resource in two different channels with the experimental functionality in one resource, and then we can decide when we want to graduate it to the next channel uh, is an improvement. Just to follow up on what Keith said, I should have emphasized in the beginning that I see this as a really good force and function for us to reevaluate a lot of our stability which is what Enhancement Subgroup was created for. And we all say that we want the features in Ethereum to move up and out, but we haven't had a really good vehicle to do that with yet. And I think this is a good vehicle that can ensure that we pay attention to what matters and really solidly denote it as sta stable and those that we can denote as stable, um, especially those pseudo stable ones that we have been supporting for a while, we can hopefully try and like, not have the responsibility of stability um, based on this new model. Go ahead, Justin. One thing I think, yeah, one thing I think we should also keep in mind is what we're conveying to the users, because we've trained users to uh, build things on alpha and beta, and how we're going to communicate to them that they should stop doing that. And I think that will might might be more confusing if, for example, we have the ambient APIs that we say, no, no, we're really following this model, but we have for sidecars, we're not there yet. I, I think we it's already very confusing and this has the potential to make it even more confusing. So we, I think we should just keep in mind how we're communicating that. And if we decide to go with two different ways of creating APIs, what that would look like and how we would communicate that. I hope that all new APIs will be created using this model. So not necessarily having to maintain creating um, new APIs in two different ways. But I do see that either we have to conform this across all of Istio to an extent or figure out how we can map those um, the understandings between what we're doing in the regular way, alpha to um, stable, or what we're doing in this new proposal. Yeah, I mean, we, I think far too often that this, like Istio historically has just assumed that people are familiar with all of the history and all of the parts of, you know, like you have to kind of know everything about Istio in order to use it. And so if we, um, you know, I, I just repeat myself at this point, but I think it, we've got to be very clear 
um, about, you know, so somebody who's casually using Istio, that they understand what these APIs mean. And I, and I understand you're saying, well, for new APIs, we won't do this. But if we, if we, as long as we may say that, but then if we don't do it for the old APIs, how do users know which are the new ones and which ones are the old ones? Yeah, I, we don't need to solve that right now. I just want to mention that. I think I agree. If I understand what you're saying correctly, Justin, I think I agree. I think to to try to to slice this between ambient and sidecar will just be will, will be extremely confusing, and I don't think it'll give us the critical mass that we're really wanting to get some to actually make something like this work. So I think it's an all or nothing type of proposal, if that's what you're saying. Yeah, basically, or. Well, yeah, more, I don't know how not to do that. I'm not necessarily saying it needs to be, but I, but otherwise it's going to be totally confused. In my mind, it's going to be totally confusing. I agree. I think it's the all or nothing as well. And I think the only caveat is we have to figure out the psych stuff that we don't care to touch anymore. Like, what are we going to label that as? Especially if it's not necessarily stable, but folks have been using it underneath a stable assumption in the past. Yeah. So one of the ways that Gateway API approached this um, was basically a slow decommission of beta. So there's one specific resource in Gateway API, uh, Reference Grant, which basically has no intention of ever moving to stable, but it's in, because of it's there's work happening in SIG off to upstream it uh, into uh, Kubernetes core, but it's an important part of the API. So that is the only resource that is in the standard channel as beta. Um, but basically the intent is no new resources enter the standard channel as beta. So something like that is an approach we could consider to basically not regress on the stability guarantees of existing beta resources, but don't put anything new into that place. I like that a lot. Is there any other comments? I know. I think there's an interesting discussion in the chat I think you might want to bring into the main floor here about the relationship between runtime versus API compatibility. Um, I don't necessarily see a lot of that discussed in the doc, the, or, the doc or rather the doc specifically seems to be talking about API stability and API compatibility. Um, but I do think it's a valid question. Um, and Quat Carson might be, you know, maybe you want to come up and, and discuss more, but it seems to be that there, there are two avenues here. Either we tie API stability to, um, to runtime stability, and by the way, Gateway API does this kind of for dependencies. Um, so uh, multi-cluster service, the MCS API is a, allegedly supposed to be moving to, to GA soon. But if you know there, there, there's just a, you know, a, a clarification in the Gateway API doc that the Gateway API multi-cluster service integration is going to be alpha for us or, or beta or whatever for as long as the MCS API is. Um, and, and that we're not going to have a V1 or a, a standard resource that where the dependency is not standard. Um, that's, that's, that's one approach. The other approach is to have two different processes, one for to, to, to share or to codify the runtime stability and another for the API stability. And this proposal would be specifically for API stability. So uh, I'd love right. to hear discuss that more. Yeah, so my, my my issue is that once the, the incentives are going to be gone to stabilize runtime, so the only incentive right now to stabilize runtime is to improve the API. Once you make API stable, and since it's basically East your developers who are supposed to stabilize it, there's no more incentive. So unless we deliberately incentivize people to stabilize runtime separately from the API, there's just not going to be work done. And you know, it's going to be a bad situation. We have a stable API with permanently unstable runtime. It's just gives and, bad impression. 
I'm curious if we can solve this by making this part of the graduation criteria where runtime should be stabilized as well. We can. I'm just, I just wanted to be mentioned somewhere. Either way, it has to be explicit whether you want it to be part of the graduation or not. It has to be stated somewhere because right now it's it's not clear, and people come from different assumptions. Thanks for bringing this up because I didn't even think of this. Um, and then along these lines, I am really curious to still explore how this will work well with John's new proposal around like iterating on defaults and um semantic like versions so i don't know if you're all familiar with that as well but i think there's some form of overlap or collaboration that will need to occur i guess john do you have any thoughts on how this interacts with your proposal or direction you want to see it go if you're still there um yeah um it's tricky i mean it's decoupled from api compatibility certainly it's more of the runtime side um so i don't think it's a complete answer for that. <laughs> I'll say for me, reading your proposal, John, like one of the things that I, I asked about, I think, last week was how, what was the scope? Is it just runtime? Is it also in fact API? And for me, I think this, this proposal, this process is the missing piece for how we can reason about runtime compatibility guarantees and behaviors and defaults, and additionally have an API for the users to, in, to interact with that runtime that's consistent. And in order for that, contract to be, and I agree with Kwa, in order for that contract to be truthful, in order to truly mean what it is that we say, the API must take a dependency on the run, all the runtimes it can be applied to. So for example, uh, a silly example, um, the sidecar resource doesn't have any dependency on the ambient runtime, or the, yeah, the ambient runtime, at least not at present. I don't think that there are any plans to, and if we do, we probably want to change the name. As a result, you know, if, if, if sidecar is, is stable for the sidecar runtime, sidecar data plane, but not for the ambient data plane, that shouldn't prevent sidecar from being moved to, to standard or V1, or what have you. Um, so that's kind of my perspective. I, I think that these actually compose together in a very, uh, in a very nice way. Um, and again, just to, for, for clarity, I, I think that we do, for, for these to work, they'll have to be applied to both ambient as well as uh, the, the the sidecar data plane, sidecar runtime, um, because the biggest thing our users need for, from us is consistency. If it takes them reading the doc for 15, 20 minutes to understand what stability their product is at, um, uh, Istio is a full product, API plus implementation plus runtime, if it takes them forever to figure that out, then that's not a great experience for them. So it's got to be consistent. And any other thoughts that you like to discuss now? If not, I think this is a really good starting point for me to continue fashioning out this proposal. And it seems like everyone is in agreement that we do want to adopt this, just to figure out the details. Uh, if we do it for ambient, I will be the most happy. But I'm okay. Also, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not. I, I love this proposal. It's just the, the concerns that John discussed earlier about uh, you know what we do with existing user because again we cannot. Okay. Um, I will figure out the best way to go about the existing features concern because I think we're just doing it for ambient. There's confusion, but then. There's also the glaring issue of like, um, how do we deal with some 
features that shouldn't doesn't need to change, I guess, and is already considered stable. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone. I can pass the mic to the next person on the agenda. Okay, that is me. I can share the screen as well. Just a sec. Okay. Yeah, so I added this item about the um, open telemetry things last week, but we didn't have time to, to get to it. Uh, yeah, so I've been joining the meetings and, and uh, having discussions about about this for, for some time, and I created this, uh, tried to create this document here. Is it my screen share working? I guess so, right? Okay. Yes, we can see. Uh, Right, cool. Thanks. Yeah, so I have this document that goes into more detail on it, but um, just to iterate, uh, uh, starting from Envoy 128, which is already out, they uh, announced the deprecation of open tracing and open sensing. So the, the tracing library is there because both projects are archived. And uh, starting from version, I just learned this this week, starting from actually version 129, uh, the integrations that use those those two tracers will fail actually if you start using them. So Envoy will abort starting. Then you need to there's a they will add a flag or is a flag in being worked on to turn this on in 20, 129. But by 130 they will completely remove the dependencies that will not work anymore. And uh, I work for Dynatrace as a observability backend and. Uh, our current uh, Istio Envoy integration uh, there relies on, on these two libraries. And basically, when this version is out, our customers, which are quite a lot of them, large customers, will basically lose all observability in their, all, in their entire mesh. Uh, and so I presented this a couple of weeks ago and uh, was more or less uh, pointed that we should probably reuse the open telemetry things that are already there today in uh and uh, the the trouble is that uh there's a lot of features that are missing and uh we were working in in envoy to add this this things and improve the situation so for example there is only way to today to export via grpc uh, so we added a new uh, exporter or a new functionality to envoy to be able to export via http so that is already merged in envoy and when 28 is already available and we just merged uh, a couple of resource detectors that is also an open telemetry con concept to allow to enrich the telemetry data. So to, for example, load uh, attributes about the host, about the pod, about all those, those sor sort of things about the process. So essentially what I'm trying is that uh, I have this PR open. Uh, that was this was one of the comments in this document that we should uh, that I should probably open small PRs and, and try to iterate on the changes. And I have this PR here that is open for, for some time, which adds, adds the, the ex extends the existing tracing provider, hotel tracing provider to add support for exporting via HTTP. So I got some comments and there are some approvals already, but I got, didn't have any updates for quite a while. So I'm just wondering what, what the, uh, what you guys think, what the folks think and Together with that, I also opened two other PRs because this one that I just showed you is just for the HTTP export. But as I said, we want to add more things. We want to add uh, custom samplers, resource detectors, uh, and that will add more configs to the mesh config. That's I think was one concern that people had. Uh, so I opened this this draft PR just to show what exactly would be like the full config that we would need to add to extend to use the hotel tracer there. And I also open another one uh, to show how the, the same features will be achieved for us if we add a proprietary Dynatrace trace provider. 
so this just to show the difference in new configuration that we would need to add into mesh config versus uh, the one if we go to the hotel route and make it available for everybody. Uh, yeah, so I'm just looking for for feedback in 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 direction how to move forward with this. Um, how we can uh, yeah go on because as I said the version of Envoy 129 is coming and as soon as customers upgrade they will lose basically all the traces in their mesh. So um, first of all, thank you for this. This is um, really appreciate the way you've championed this. Uh, it's it's awesome. Uh, looks like the stakeholders on the PR you mentioned uh, is TOC, and we've got a couple of TOC members here on the call. Do uh, do any of those folks want to come up mute or put in the chat? Uh, kind of where they are on the on the PR. It does seem it's fairly time sensitive. Um, so anybody want to chime in? So it's uh, ask to uh, look at the PI in the API repo for mesh config to add the additional uh, provider. Yeah, so there is two, two two approaches, right? So I sent the two draft PIs that is in the in the documents. One is to show you to show like the entire config that we would be adding. So adding small PRs. Uh, but my my, my 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 concern was that by going with small PRs, maybe uh, it's not clear the amount of new config that needs to be added. Uh, so that's why I opened that one with the full config and also one with the proprietary Dynatrace, similar to the one that already there, Datadog, Lightstep, and, and Sky, uh, uh, and, and the others uh, providers. Uh, because in the beginning, I proposed to add the Dynatrace one, uh, like a proprietary uh, new tracer uh, provider, but was uh, said that we should probably just use the hotel one, which I'd assume makes sense. I, I agree, uh, but one of the arguments was that I think we want to reduce the amount of new things in mesh config, and I just opened the two proposals just to just to 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 show how much config one would be versus the other. Okay, th thank you for that clarification. So you're not suggesting to add uh, your own proprietary one, but a more generic one into the Istio API. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm happy to take a look um, later today. Does anyone from the TOC have any objection to, to that proposal? I can't confirm or deny I have objections as I didn't look at it because it was in draft mode. So I hope that can take a look as well. OK, thank you. I remember you had some objections uh, on the um, specific vendor integration. So hopefully make this more on the open telemetry level so it, it will be more reasonable for the community. Yes, I, I definitely agree, yes. And uh, we, we have contributed. We also needed these features in Envoy because of the deprecation. And we also contributed to just add open telemetry things and not Dynatrace specific there. So we we already on this path. Yeah, so appreciate uh, reviews and, and so on. I will be uh, not 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 in for, for a while for vacation and so on, but uh, there will be other people from Dynatrace that will keep an eye on the PR and, and update it if needed. OK, great. Uh, so what, what are the timeline are you looking? I assume it's tied to the Envoy releases, so we have the timeline uh, clearly uh, known for us. Yeah, so. Uh, we still are still working from a last piece in, in Envoy, which is a, a custom sampler. Uh, but uh, yeah, the timeline would be uh, February or, or something like that, because I assume customers will not upgrade as soon as 129 is, uh, uh, when Envoy 129 is, or whatever next release of Istio that uses 129. So I think we still have some time, but yeah. March would be something ideal. February, March would be something ideal. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So it aligns with our next issue release pretty much, which is 121. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I already uh, have also another branch. I'm not sure if it's public, but uh, if I push, but I also already uh, modified the uh, uh, Istio, let's say, core or code to, to actually use this new. So everything works uh, pretty well already. So, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much again for raising this uh, to our attention. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for listening and Pay attention to if there is any discussions there. There is also a thread on, on Slack forgot mentioning. So if you want to sync offline, there is also a thread about this there. And that's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, do we have anything else on the agenda for today? Looks like no. Should we wrap the call? Up? All right. Thanks to everybody for joining, and see you guys in a few minutes in the ambient meeting. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.